Hi guy, welcome to the Amiga Armor Podcast. As always, I'm your host Lavarius, and in this week's show we will be taking a look under Beneath the Steel Sky. Honestly, you've no idea how long that took me to come up with for an opening line. Anyway, getting back to the show. Yeah, I do try my best to try and entertain you guys this week. Before we get to that though, it's about time to have a look at some Amiga news. Here's something that blew my mind when I found out about it. I'm trying my best not to over-exaggerate. And this was over on the Belgian Amiga Club. One of their members has done a complete rebuild of the Amiga 1200 motherboard. It uses modern components and shifts the design around a fair old bit. So stuff like the PC MCIA slot has been removed and a compact flash socket has been placed there instead. They've even added all the requirements for an internal power supply. It's pretty amazing from the picture they've shown so far and I'm really intrigued as to where this is going to go and how much it's actually going to be when it's available. The best part is it's all open source and there's plenty of regular updates going on. It's already gone into limited production with the second revision coming out shortly. This I suppose ties in with the fact that the hardware everyone has now is fine but in another 20 years or so we have no idea just what sort of state all this kit will be in or even if we'll be able to use it anymore. This lot could make for the perfect replacement. I will post a link to it in the show notes if you want to learn more about it. But this sort of stuff is going to become a regular thing so it's definitely worth keeping an eye on it. In our last bit of news this week let's have a look at a brand new Amiga game. Jet Hunt AGA has recently popped up on the English Amiga boards and seems to be another attempt at redoing the Atari's 2600 Hero game. It tasks you with running around the levels, saving people and blasting your way through all sorts of walls and traps. It's been created by foreign poster Coagulus and this one obviously requires at least an A1200 because again you're using that AGA chip. I gave this one a quick go and had a right blast with it, but the best part about it all was the soundtrack. That easily rivals anything you used to get in the commercial games, and I've had it playing on in the background on my stereo a couple of times this week. It's really that good. Coagulus wrote it himself and he's done a stellar job with the music, and I really wish that there was more of it. I'll add a link to the usual place, but this is definitely one for your recommended lists. Now this next thing doesn't really count as news, but it is something awesome nevertheless, so I thought I'd bring it up. I was chatting to Rialden Computers over on Twitter recently. We got into a bit of back and forth about retro games and things like that, and I basically said that I was planning to do a full episode on Beneath the Steel Sky, especially with the new game coming up. And I've been looking at his online store because several months ago, in fact I think it was last year, I ended up buying a Monkey Island 2 mouse mat. Now this was the main box art, it's one of my favourite posters of all time for any sort of game. It still takes pride of place by my Amiga. And one of the one things I've always wanted is Beneath the Steel Sky. I think it's one of those real legacy games. And I sort of half mentioned it to him. And before I knew it, he was like taking pictures and sending me shots over. And he'd actually printed off a mug. And and I was like, oh my god, this would be fantastic. I mean, if you could maybe do something to push out like at the same time when I release this episode. Lo and behold, he has done. And I will stick a link into the show notes. But what was even more amazing is he actually sent me the mug and a Beneath the Steel Sky logo mouse mat. I mean, I was absolutely blown away. I will take full pictures and stick these up on the Twitter post for this today. So it'll be on the Discord as well. By all means, go and have a look. But what even blew my mind completely is, and this was a complete surprise, he actually sent me a mouse mat and mug of the Amiga Armour Show logo. These really are one of a kind. I was absolutely taken back by this. They look absolutely fantastic. I've never expected anything for doing this show. The joy of it is actually recording and doing the research and stuff. So he does mugs and mats and badges and stickers and vinyl decals and that sort of thing. Now there's loads and loads of retro gaming. It's not just Amiga things. So by all means, go and check it out and see what you think. I will have to say that shows like mine live or die by iTunes or Apple podcast reviews. 
by all means, if you're enjoying the show and you really like it, go and pop us a review up there or anything on whatever podcast app because it always helps us get noticed and gets the word out there. As long as you guys like this show, I will keep doing it. And that's all the news I have lined up for this week. For now, let's mosey on over to see what's hiding beneath the steel sky. mentioned this before but I have a bit of a weird confession when it comes to Beneath the Steel Sky. I was obsessed with it growing up. I would play this over and over and over again. I would explore every single part of it with a fine tooth comb, trying out every possible way to die and I was only 14 when I bought that big black glossy box and cracked it open with what felt like a million floppy disks. One of my biggest takeaways from it is I love the look of Robert Foster and his hero's trench coat as it was in my mind. I thought it was the bee's knees and super cool so I spent a couple of months searching every single high street store for, well, a similar jacket. There wasn't any internet back then so all I was left with was searching like a madman but no matter where I went there wasn't anything similar and I ended up just stuck with a boring old raincoat instead. I must have drove my parents nuts though looking all over the place pestering to go to all these different shops practically every weekend and I'm still surprised that they still don't moan about it till this day. So yes, if you haven't realised yet, I really really love this game. I can still quote parts of it to this day and every background is emblazoned in my mind. Yet, I haven't played it for years. It might sound weird but I got to the point where each playthrough just didn't offer me a single thing anymore. So as you can probably guess, I still have lots of fond memories of this, but it's kind of refreshing in a way to go back all these years later and just see if it actually holds up today. The publisher behind this was Virgin Software. Prior to this, they'd worked on games like Aladdin, Goal, Krusty's Funhouse, etc. Quite a lot of big Amiga games around about this time. They were really a powerhouse of a publisher. The developer was Revolution, they previously worked on King's Quest 6 which did surprise me and Allure of the Temptress. Surprisingly very few, I was expecting a lot more when I was going over their history. Now it came out in 1994, yeah, I was definitely 14 years old, on 15 floppy disks. Now you needed a hard drive for this for sure, even back then I think I had that 20 megabyte one in my A600 and it just about fit it all on but my god it really really was close. At so many discs it's probably the biggest floppy count that I ever actually got to play, I think after that was Simon the Sorcerer but that was probably 10 or 12, never anything as crazy as this. It was quite a high end title and priced at £34.99, that's a hell of a lot of money, probably paying for all them blank discs inside and it was just a single player game. Only two coders worked on this, David Sykes who previously did Lure of the Temptress and James Long who only ever worked on this one. Graphics wise, Dave Gibbons who was the lead artist responsible for the comic that came packed in the box and all the characters that were spread around the game. Now there was a team of five people in total working on the graphics, people like Adam Tween, Paul Humphreys, they all worked on Lure of the Temptress before. This was Dave's first game by the way, He'd not worked on that previously. The music was composed by Dave Cummins, he only ever worked on this as well, and Tony Williams who did things like Judge Dredd, 
Teenage Mutant Hero Turtles, I Will Never Say Ninja, and Chucky Egg 2, as well as a few others. I'm sure by now I've mentioned this before, but I'll never forget having a small exam table that I think I snagged from a local high school, which I sat right next to me Amiga, and I used it for laying out lots and lots of floppy disks and swapping them for big games like this. It's no surprise that they died out as, well, a software medium when a single CD could hold the entire lot and still have tons more room to hold plenty more. How things have come, eh, since then? We just put up with so much back then, I'm surprised we even managed to get through it all. Enough of that, anyway, let's get on with the history. Revolution had only just finished work on Lure of the Temptress when it seems game designer Charles Cecil wanted to break away from fantasy and tackle something new. Thanks to being a fan of films like Mad Max and Blade Runner, he already had a kind of apocalyptic future in mind to place the new game in. Thanks to Mad Max being set in Australia, a decision was made almost from the off to use a futuristic Sydney with a few London underground train stations being added just to make the locations a little bit more mysterious for players to explore and not being too tied into a real world place. When it came to other influences, Charles has said that he wanted to offer a glimpse of hope in a dystopian future, at least as he called it for the game's story. For other inspirations, the 1920s classic Metropolis played a big part in all this, showing a world divided in two with its use of the poor and the lowest levels of a city and the wealthiest being placed up high in the sky. He really wanted that to come across in this game. The first step before all this though was to come up with a fully fledged and mapped out story. So Dave Cummins was brought in house to work as a scriptwriter, deciding early on that they would make sure all the puzzles to be used would work alongside the story that they came up with. Working together, they managed to complete the full story, but realised at the end that it was quite dark and gritty, so to lighten up the mood a little, it was decided to mix in some humour to help make it easier for the player to be able to stomach what was actually happening on screen. To deal with this, they included Joey the Robot, who was added to help tie in a lot of the comedy and give a much easier way to introduce lots of random story elements. Before Beneath the Steel Sky, graphic adventures didn't really have a second character at all, especially one that would follow the player around or even interact with them, so this was probably a first for the game. When it came to the opening animation, they realised that it would have been far too difficult to include all of the backstory that they'd come up with, so copies of this ended up being sent over to the artist Dave Gibbons. Now, you might be familiar with this guy's name as he had previously worked on the Watchmen graphic novel with Alan Moore. Charles was already familiar with Dave Gibbons' work and realised early on that he could bring over his own artistic style to the game and help create its world in, say, a much better way than the studio could ever manage to handle. So, asked him to be involved with the character designs and all the background work that was needed. This guy had done things like Judge Dredd and the whole 2010 AD comic range, I believe it's called. I don't know much about that stuff, but I believe it's a very good set of comics. Dave was so impressed with what they sent him that he was soon beaving away on his son's Amiga and trying his best to come up with some designs. I'm not sure what art package he would have used, but this would probably have been around the whole time of deluxe paint especially with it being packed in with practically every Amiga at this point. After drawing each piece of art on canvas, he would then try and replicate this across on screen by hand. This must have been well before decent scanners were even a thing, so I can only imagine the large amount of work this must have entailed. The opening comic was drawn in the same style to go with the story and the only problem Dave seems to have come across after its production was with a can of Foster's beer. Now they'd included that on a page to show off where the main character managed to get his name from, Robert Foster. 
The Foster's Beer Company didn't like the association with the game and asked Revolution to remove it. They were happy to oblige, but it must have been really strange at the time, especially considering the amount of free press and advertising that they missed out on. I'm sure it made sense to their marketing people at the time, but looking back now, it just seems a very, very strange decision. Going back to the gameplay, Charles Cecil was determined to make Beneath the Steel Sky a challenge, making sure that all of the puzzles used were really tough to solve, as he didn't want people rushing through the whole story and moving on to the next big thing. There's some real mind-bending puzzles in there, and I'm not even sure how I managed to get through them as a kid. I know for a fact that I definitely didn't have any sort of written guide or anything in the magazines to rely on. I completely did it by myself. One of the game's most unique features that we certainly have to mention here is the virtual theatre engine. Now, that started out as part of Lure of the Temptress, so it started out well before Bass. As a system, it allowed sprites to follow scripted commands and wander around the screen freely. You have to remember that at this time, up until this point, every single Graphic Adventures game's characters were all locked firmly in place. Most are still doing this even to this day, so it's quite the achievement for Revolution almost 25 years later that it still stands out as being quite a good feature. The whole virtual theatre engine was one thing that really stood out to me even back then and I always wondered why no one else ever copied it for other games. Having people wandering around can make a whole world feel a lot more interactive and the characters feel a lot less static. It's just a really, really good thing to do. We will talk about that a bit more in depth later on. During my research for the show, I did manage to come across some confusing, muddled stories about what happened with the voice work, and I actually did my best to try and find out what happened. I couldn't really confirm anything, and no one seemed to really know for sure what happened, so dismissing all that, I went straight to the source on Twitter and dropped Revolution a line. The amazing thing is they are still around today and trading as a company. I was told that the actor Vincent Reagan invited other actors that he knew from the Royal Shakespeare Company, that's what's often touted around the net, to play the different voice parts in the game. As production went on, they moved over to use more experienced voice directors who then had contact with a wider community of actors, so they were all completely replaced which is why the Finnish voice work is such a brilliant standard. We'd never really heard anything like this before and it really shows just how good that initial voice script must have been. When it came to the final launch, it seems that the game did really, really well, managing to sell over 300,000 copies in its full lifetime and top the number one spot on the UK Gallop charts. To me, it definitely put the company on the gaming map, and in my eyes, it will always be one of the best Amiga graphic adventure games. It's still available to this day, and you can even pick up a free edition over on GOG. There's also been a lot of talk about an upcoming sequel. This has started in the old rumour mill since around 2004 with some hints at a new game seeming to pop up every few years. Then, out of nowhere, Beyond the Steel Sky was announced earlier this year, with new sites saying it's got a possible release date on Apple Arcade by the end of 2019. The trailer for it is a more cartoony Borderlands graphical style, and it shows Robert Foster returning to Union City in this whole 3D adventure gaming style. It's very different to what we'd seen before. I really wasn't sure what to make of that trailer at first, but after seeing some of the puzzles that come on in later pictures and going back to the first game, I'm really excited to see what they can come up with. Charles Cecil and Dave Gibbons have both returned for the sequel, so it's looking very, very promising and I really can't wait to get my hands on a copy. Parts-wise, we only ever saw Beneath the Steel Sky on the PC and Amiga, 
There was that iTunes release later on, but that was over 10 or 15 years later, so I don't really include that in the ports. In Beneath the Steel Sky, you take the role of Robert Foster, abducted by brutal security forces and brought to Union City. Foster's fate is in your hands as he talks to people and explores the areas around him in an attempt to discover why he was brought to the city. At the start of the game, Foster has escaped from the wreck of a helicopter in which he was kidnapped. Now it's up to you to ensure that he eludes the security forces in order to discover his past and his destiny. I do love the brevity of the story in the manual. It just throws you right in there with barely any hint of what's going on in the wider world, expecting you to follow the comic book and find out about it all for yourself. Beneath the Steel Sky doesn't mess about. After loading the brief intro screen, a copter is shown crashing down into a metropolis. Scrambling onto a walkway, guards begin to shoot at you with lasers and there's a mad dash to try and escape all of their shots. All of this is animated on a single screen with our hero Robert Foster fleeing to a nearby factory. Entering the building, Robert will quickly climb a metal walkway to his side to hide away as a guard enters from the doorway and begins to chat to a worker. Listening in for a few moments, you get to learn about being branded a saboteur and how the chief of security, Reich, wants to hunt you down personally. Thus the game begins and your first step is to try and work out how to escape from the guard and the walkway without being caught. Everything in the game is mouse driven and controlling Robert is a step up from the usual graphic adventures. Clicking on any accessible part of the screen will have him walk over at a steady pace. Probably the game's first good point as it's quick enough to not be too frustrating and certainly not slow enough to annoy. Rolling the cursor over any possible exit will reveal a large arrow making it easy to find which way to go in any of the rooms. The usual verbi you see in these type of games has been dropped straight in the bin, which frees up all of that lovely space right at the bottom of the screen. Unless you've played a lot of these games before, you probably won't have realised just how cramped the half screen view can be, but this displays every single inch of the surroundings just to show off more of its gorgeous artwork. Clicking the left mouse button will make Robert look at what's under the cursor and right clicking will make him interact with it. They've broken away from the old style of having to push, pull, open, close etc. This time the game just makes the best choice of what to actually do. If an object can be picked up then after an animation plays it's placed in the inventory. This is coming from a time when graphic adventure games were trying to change the core of their design just to stay relevant and not become stale. Beneath the Steel Sky simplifies the typical graphic adventure controls in many ways but it still leaves enough room to not seem too basic. Hovering the mouse at the top of the screen will bring down an inventory and another right click on anything there will let you use whatever you've got highlighted. You can also combine the objects if you need to for first time players it might seem a bit confusing at first but the first puzzle of the game is time based so it gives you plenty of chances to try and learn how to use it. This involves having to grab a metal bar and escaping out of the door before Stephen Reich the Nazi like security officer catches up to you. The game requires you to be quick on your feet to find an item and to do the right thing before you are caught. I guess this acts as a sort of tutorial as in a way it teaches you how to use save as much as possible. This isn't a LucasArts game so you can die in lots and lots of places. For the most part it's well telegraphed but you need to be wary of using that F5 key to save often. Talking to other characters in the world isn't the usual graphic adventure norms. Pressing either mouse button will start a conversation and a text selection bar will pop up at the top of the screen. I'm used to dialogue trees being at the bottom, but it does free up an awful lot of the screen space and lets you see more of what's actually going on. One thing I must point out is the number of 
funny deaths that can actually happen. It's not up to the same level, say, as earlier Sierra online games, but using a fake ID in the security office, then fibbing about it being covered in porridge was definitely a highlight of the game, especially when you get lasered by a scanner, turning you into a pile of ash. The reactions from the guards are priceless, and it's the sort of thing that's littered throughout the game. It's got a real dark sense of humour and fleshes out the world as a whole. The comedy moments often reminded me of some very Monty Python-esque scenes. Another that comes to mind is the doctor's surgery. A guy has his chest wide open on an operating table and if you try and talk to him, he will start chatting away quite happily, asking if you brought any grapes for him without a care in the world. It's so off the wall and random, especially when he spoke out, that I still can't believe it actually happened almost 20 odd years later. The text does have its adult moments too, with the odd swear word mixed in that would make me do a double take as a teenager. This sort of stuff is commonplace today, but I guess back then in the mid 90s, I'm sure games just didn't do that sort of stuff. Or maybe I was just a little bit sheltered from it all. It just means that the game's definitely not for kids. The whole game is set within Union City with you confined to a single tower, slowly able to move between the floors thanks to some handy elevators. It expands the more the story progresses and where you would normally be able to wander off into the city, they prevented that with things like the bridge being down thanks to the helicopter crashing and taking out the walkway. I think it was an obvious thing for him to do, but it's restrictive in a slight enough way that you never really notice unless you want to go out and explore more of the world. I'm trying my best not to spoil the game for anyone who hasn't played it yet, and I would suggest if you are intrigued enough from me going on about it, then I would suggest keeping well away from any sort of Google searches, because it could ruin the game's main central twist. There's a big mystery running through the entire game which slowly reveals itself the closer you get to the end and a lot of this comes from various conversations and interactions that you have which you really need to experience first and rather than having it ruined by something online. For me the ending was quite a surprise even back then and I still think back on it fondly today. What I'm trying to get across is just how thought provoking it all is. The story is one that will stay with you for a good while after, so just be prepared for something truly special from the script they've come up with. The puzzles and deaths do work together on occasions, and there isn't even a straightforward ending to the entire game. You get to decide what happens, and you need to really think on your feet about how the story ends. When I was playing this for the first time, I started desperately searching for similar games, but nothing could even touch this or come close during the Amiga days. I'm getting a bit starry eyed about all this and not really going into how the puzzles work. Graphic adventure games are always tough to cover in a show, because you have to be careful of spoilers and be able to talk around all of the basics, revealing just enough to show if it's a good enough game or a bad one. You've probably already guessed by now what I think of Beneath a Steel Sky. The puzzles can be cruel at times and real head scratchers. Exploring the world will often throw up simple things like speaking to other people, using keys in locks or leaving dog biscuits on a plank to watch it fall into a pool. At least enough to distract its owner and for you to sneak through a doorway. Despite there being only a few floors of the tower, there's a lot of wraparound areas and underground sections that eventually lead on to the final destination. Where this breaks away from the usual real world locations is when having solved your way deep into the depths of the security center, it gives you access to a Link VR terminal. Here, the player is transformed into a sort of hybrid digital avatar that can walk around a VR world with floating eyeballs and crystals, all part of trying to hack your way into a computer system. That all sounds quite random, and it does sound it, but the game does pull it off because it introduces each piece slowly, 
and guide you around them like they are all perfectly normal. Link terminals can also be accessed in the real world from reading lots of messages on computer screens to setting off devices in certain areas. It's all very clever stuff and you get a good sense of this whole wider technical world of which you are a very small part of. I guess it makes up for a sort of email system in a time period where people didn't really know about that day to day. Remember, it was still the early 90s. I would miss a lot not talking about the backdrops and the art. Dave Gibbon's work is on a whole other level and you simply can't compare it to any other games of the time. For fans of 2000 AD, there's a strong sense of the comic Judge Dredd, especially in its art, seeping through every section of the game. And even if you haven't read those comics before, the look and feel is something all onto itself. Rich backgrounds, buildings and cityscapes can be seen at every single section of the tower and the surrounds perfectly show off the futuristic world. There's a strong Terminator and Blade Runner vibe mixed in there that, combined with the script and humour, gives it an almost Hollywood touch. Each part of the tower has its own residence and often for a game like this they wouldn't be given very little attention to detail, they just chuck in a few random NPCs and hope for the best. But here it feels like they've all been lavished in lots and lots of detail. The way they move thanks to the virtual theatre system mixed in with plenty of chat options means they all take on a life of their own. It's not up to say Elder Scrolls RPG levels of random conversation but there's enough here to make them all stand out. I should say that I don't think I have the skill to talk about the nuances of what they were trying to bring across here for the player. There's just so much going on with the art and the sound and the script work that I was often in awe in just so many sections of the game and I really hope you can understand what I'm trying to get across. Sometimes I know I can go off on tangents, I'm sure that's why a lot of you even listen to the show. But when I find myself playing a game that's this good, I just can't help it. Moving on to the music, it varies throughout every location, like you would expect, and although you are probably going to want to play the CD32 version, especially because it's got the best audio, for the most part, no matter which Amiga this is on, there's a rich musical mix that just deserves to have your speakers turned up full. It's comical, dark, cybernetic, tunes with matching sound effects that made me think that this was a big studio development, not done by some smaller UK developer. The voice work is available for CD32 users, but I do believe fans have made a WHD Load Edition which has access to all of them, so if you want to give it a go, that's the place to try it out. With the voices, the worry with that is, because it was made in the 1990s, there's probably going to be not much effort put into it. Not a lot of studios would invest what was required. They probably have someone reading off a few cards of text and not even linking all this stuff together. But here the actors really sound like they're all having a good time. The samples are great and clear, with lots of them trying the best to bring across the comedy or seriousness depending on the situation. Every effort has gone into making this a joy to listen to and it's truly something when I find myself wishing that some of the bigger companies put this much effort into the games back then. Well, I think we've heaped enough praise on this by now. It's about time to start looking at what's actually wrong with it and what I think about it in total. Firstly, finding issues for this is like searching for needles in a haystack. But for me, the biggest problem has to be wanting to explore the whole city, but not being allowed to leave the tower area. The visuals tease at cars speeding along skyways and a world to see, yet you get stuck to just simple wandering. I just felt that a bit of vehicle travelling could have maybe offered a better sense of the place, but I'm really just trying to find niggles here, it's not a major suggestion, just something I'd like to have seen it improved with. One of its biggest issues I have to say is, the benefit between CDs and disc swaps stands out a mile here. 15 floppy disks was an insane number even back then, 
but loading this from a CD or hard drive is a must today. I'm not sure even today how I even put up with all that back then. And I did remember finding myself double checking the number of discs when I went back to look at a box copy today. I fired up some of the ADFs on an emulator and some of the disc loads were 15 to 20 seconds long. Keep that in mind if you want to give the floppy disk version a go. To be fair, they did number the discs really well, so when you're jumping from obvious place to obvious place, it's not skipping around to say disc 1 to disc 5 to disc 10. It does tend to keep them in a good order as you're wandering around each area. So I think even they knew that it was a bit over the top. Another problem I had this week was the whole VR link environment. It's a great idea to explore this cyber world, but the whole thing with yin and yang, passwords and really, really oblique puzzles just don't gel with the overall experience. This was also where I got stuck as a kid for weeks on end, and it's a very frustrating place to get through, much more than any other section in the game. The good thing is, there's not too much of this area, and even then I'd say use a walkthrough if you want to get through it, it's very annoying, save yourself the hassle. Finally, looking back over at the characters and the world after all this time, the worst thing I can take away from this game is just, I don't really understand why I love Robert Foster's coat so much. I must have been mad, because today it looks more like some old janitor or a caretaker in one of them big grey hang down coats. It was a terrible thing to get caught up on and I don't know what else it says about my fashion sense. With that behind us, let's move on to the magazine scores. First up was See You Amiga at 95%, Amiga Format 94%, The One 93%, Amiga Action at 92% and finally Always the lowest, Amiga Power with 86%. I couldn't find any Duff reviews in the magazines, none dropped lower than 85%, even on the later CD32 re-release. I did read several of them cover to cover and couldn't disagree with a word that they were saying, each offering all sorts of praise, and if you haven't guessed already, I'm right up there as one of them. As you get older, it's easy to forget about things that were, say, a big influence on you growing up, especially ones that really stood out, demanding your attention. I'd completely forgotten about Joey the Robot, exploring all the different ways you can upgrade his body and chuckle along as he spent absolutely ages chatting up a hologram in one of the floors. There's so many innuendos and light bits of swearing in the game that I never realised how much of a mature game it was really meant to be. Parts of this seem to appeal more to me now as an adult than they ever did when I was a kid. The virtual theatre means there's always someone to talk to, and I love just how they will go about their business without any sort of prompting from you. It's such a little change to graphic adventures, but one I thought added so much depth to it. There's also genuinely funny, dramatic and sweet moments in the script that have the making of a brilliant movie. If this had ever been turned into a film, then I think they could have made one that's right up there with Blade Runner. The surprises and twists and turns along the way would make for a great movie to watch on the big screen, and it's definitely one I'd want to go back and watch over and over again. One of the cornerstones of Beneath a Steel Sky for me has to be the friendship with Joey. He starts out as a comedy sidekick that cracks the odd joke but eventually breaks away from all that the further you go in the adventure. As you learn more and more about how the two met, it's almost as if it's a real relationship developing. It's a joy to behold as they become closer and closer. This isn't the norm, only a good story and script could do this, and I think it's why I always wanted more characters like Joey in other games. I'm always open to suggestions, so if you think I've missed anything obvious here, especially on the Amiga or PC, then please drop me a line and let me know, because I really want more deep stories like this, because it's missing from a lot of modern titles. I don't think that there's many Amiga games that can link the audio, art, script and voice work together, at least in a way to make such a great experience. 
The ending to the story, it's such a surprise, it feels just right and it wouldn't be possible without so many different things coming together in the perfect way. That's Beneath the Steel Sky in a nutshell. It sets out to achieve so much and gets it all spot on. This is graphic adventure gold, pure and simple. If you've never played Bass or one of these type of games before, then this is as good as it gets. It's the sort of game I will always love and never stop recommending. I can only hope I've done enough to explain why I liked it so much and why I think you will too, given chance. Part of me is fearful that the sequel's not going to reach the same heights as I've always held this in such high regard, especially for so long now. But Charles Cecil and Dave Gibbons have definitely earned my trust all these years later and I will be there from day one. Call that what you will, but we'll have to make that some sort of Amiga Armour guarantee. Wow, that really has been a long one. It's just about time to finish up for this week's show, but before we do, if you'd like to get in touch about anything I've said today or even on past episodes, you can do so over at facebook.com slash Amigarama, drop me a line on Twitter, which is at Amigaramapod, or even use snail mail, which is lefarious at Amigarama.com. If you want to support the show, you can do so by dropping us a review over on Apple Podcasts or whatever you're using on your podcast app. Before we disappear though, we really do need to thank all of our Patreon supporters. They are 10 Minute Amiga Retrocast, Adam Bradley, Darren Coles, Dudley from Yes The Zine, Gary Heather, Graham Bebke, Glenn Milford from Casual Retro Gamer Weekly, Jason Warns, Lawrence Giraud, O'Brien's Retro and Vintage, Pistol, Bremsky, Quentin Barnes, Richard Legg, Richard Pearson, Steve Engeldow, and Treble. Thanks for listening, and until next time, guys. Yeah.